thing here. What time is that? Hey everybody, Keith here from Geek Time TV. Happy New Year to you all. Uh, thank you once again for uh, watching our little content here on this little channel that we're hoping to grow into a much larger channel in the years to come. So that said, if you have not subscribed, if you'd be so inclined to just hit the little subscribe button at some point during the viewing of this particular video, that would be awesome. Thank you. And now on to the content. Um, I saw Eric July, uh, Young Ripa, uh, cover this. And I wanted to kind of cover it myself and lend some of my thoughts to this. Um, you know, for those of you who have been paying attention over the last couple of years, the mainstream comic book industry here in the United States is in a lot of trouble. Um, we saw uh, just before the holidays, Aftershock Comics, a small publisher, file for Chapter 11, um, IDW publishing stock is down around a dollar uh, last time I checked, and they've had financial difficulties for years. And it just looks like um, that the uh, mainstream comic book industry is in a, taking on a whole lot of water, and there's several reasons for it. Uh, ten of them are outlined here on this CBR article uh, by Ashley Land um, that I want to go through. And, and then I'll lend a couple other thoughts as to why it's I think it's struggling as well uh, at the end. So let's just dive in, shall we, and just go bullet by bullet. So um, number 10, uh, she says, some comic books are clearly written to be TV shows and movies. Um, absolutely, uh, this is a problem. And I noticed this, wow, I mean, I, I'd say with the rise of the MCU, um, and of course before the MCU, we had a lot of, Films that people didn't realize were based on comic books, V for Vendetta, uh, Road to Perdition, things like that, uh, that a lot of the one quote unquote normies out there didn't realize were actually based on comic books and or graphic novels. Um, but when you're talking about the superhero genre and adapting the superhero content uh, for movies and television, then the absolute, you could see it, um, that these are clearly written for these comic books are written for these writers to try to uh, parlay their career into something bigger. They don't want to be writing comics forever, so they're hoping to uh, sell a story arc or adapt a story arc and move on to Hollywood. You know, not too different from the days of Stan Lee <laughs> trying to parlay his success um, into becoming Hollywood Stan, which, which he clearly did. Um, but Ashley here makes a great point that uh, she says here, the problem here is that the comics themselves don't make full use of the medium. They can feel restrained and muted, not living up to the potential that the medium allows. And I totally agree with that. Um, they use this more as a storyboarding tool than actually taking uh, the big leaps. In, you know, comic books are fantastic. The unimaginable should happen in a comic book. And uh, they feel a little packed in and a little bit more, uh, well, how should I say? resembling the world that we live in uh number nine decompression is okay but comic book readers like shorter arcs now this is something that kind of goes along with the previous bullet point um you can see now when you buy a comic book series or you dive into a comic book series they tend to go on these six issue arcs six to twelve uh the bulk of them being six uh and a lot more of them twelve and i think there's two reasons for it one a six-issue arc translates really well into a two-hour feature, right? Um, the other thing is that when you have a six-issue arc, you can fit it into one of these trade paperbacks. They do these reprints now, these collected editions, where they take six issues at a time, reprint and resell them to you uh, as a full volume. So um, I think you're getting a lot of that's what's driving this uh, ongoing arc thing versus the standalone one-off stories that I grew up reading. Um, an arc back in the day was kind of a cool new thing. Uh, there was always, it was kind of like Star Trek The Next Generation. Um, it was not a serialized TV show, but there was ongoing continuity with characters and events uh, that would resurface from time to time. But overall, it wasn't a continuing saga, much like Deep Space Nine, which was serialized, uh, was a giant story arc. So, uh, yeah, that, that could be a bit of a problem. And I think a lot of it would, be, would benefit the, um, the smaller titles, uh, would probably be more successful as just simple one-offs rather than having an arc on a, 
a book, say like like Moon Knight, um, you know, because Moon Knight's not a big selling book. I might benefit more from having one shot stories. Eight of ten, the comic book industry has seen its genres whittled away. So for those of you who don't know, I'm co-producing a documentary about Charlton Comics. I've been working on this for years now. And Charlton had one of the most diverse plethoras of genres out there because they really didn't have a superhero line. They had some action heroes, which ended up at DC, but they had horror comics, romance comics, uh, teeny bop comics, uh, drag racing comics, you name westerns, you name it. And a lot of that has gone away. Um, we still have a smattering of horror comics in the independence, a couple of romance comics here and there. Um, but a lot of it's just become superheroes and uh, IP, you know, existing IP, movies, te television properties that are being adapted into comic books. So um, it would be kind of cool to see some of this come back. You know, when I was a kid, there was like, you know, tons of that stuff out there. And Conan the Barbarian was huge back, uh, you know, 40 years ago. And, and you really don't see too many fantasy comics like that anymore. So uh, that would be interesting to resurrect. Number seven, and this is something we don't like to talk about, is shrinkage. Who wants to talk about shrinkage? I was in the pool! Uh, shrinkage of ongoing books leaves little to invest in. Um, and this is kind of also piggybacking on the previous point. Uh, there was once a time, she says, uh, in the big two, when anyone from Dazzler to Howard the Duck to Animal Man and Commandi could sustain an ongoing series. An ongoing series is key to long-term retention of customers, as well as building up the value of a character. Uh, again, I agree. Um, and now you have so many of these reboot number ones. I mean, it's almost like now, getting back to the arc part of the uh, this article, that they do these 6 to 12 issue arcs and then boom, it's a number one again. They have to reboot the whole series again. Um, you know, it's really irritating to me that something like Daredevil's on volume 8, I believe, or 9 at this point. Um, it, it, that, that, when they started doing that, that really, to me, um, it affected the way I, my interest or my eagerness to uh, continue to collect comics because part of the charm was you had this giant collection, you know, you had three, 400 issues. And then to have it just start over again at a number one, a cheapened number one, that'll never hold the value of volume one, number one, um, really is irritating. And I agree that um, in it, a lot of this has to do with the sales. They panic right away when a book only sells 6,000 copies a month or whatnot, as a smaller title, like say a Howard the Duck, and they'll just pull the plug on it right away. Maybe wait a year, try again, uh, and pull the plug on it right away. Um, so, you know... We'll see, but it, it, it would help if they had compelling characters like Howard the Duck or even Dazzler back uh, instead of things like America Chavez. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll stay tuned to this bullet point. Number six, the multiverse is fun. No, no, uh, but there can be too much of a good thing. No, this should have never been a multiverse. I've, since I was a teenager, I've hated this idea. I think it's lazy. I think it's che it's a cheap way out of a plot. Uh, can, uh, it's plot contrivances that can get you out of painting yourself into a corner with a story. Um, you know, but basically you can wave your magic wand and Flash from Earth 4 can show up and save the day. And I, it's just really irritating to me. It's, it's, it's cheap. It's a copy of a copy of a copy is not as sharp as the original kind of thing. So um, I've never liked the multiverse, and this goes all the way back to the original Crisis on Infinite Earths. You can take your alternate worlds and shove them. I think they suck, and I don't ever think it was fun. It used to bore the shit out of me back then. Um, she makes a point here that Marvel had What If and DC had Elseworlds, which, you know, What If was a fun book because it was What If. What if in this alternate reality this happened? But these were one-off stories that just it was kind of brain tease. It was kind of fun. Um, this whole thing where you've got this ongoing, these spider verses and all this garbage, just forget about it. Um, the next one, it's time to admit the superhero families are too big. Yeah. Um, I hate superhero families as much as I hate the multiverse. Um, when I pick up Batman, I don't want to read about all these knockoff characters. Um, 
you kind of might give a pass to say Nightwing or one of the Robins, but it's grown into this grotesque. Um, it's 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 buffoonery, if you ask me. I just can't stand it. And now the Spider Man titles are just as dumb. Um, you get all these derivative knockoffs of Spider Man, and they've all basically got the same skill set. It's just how goofy can we make them look, or how different can we make them look, or you know what what's kind of weird background backstory can we give them? And it's just I you know a lot of this started with that clone saga with Marvel. Um, it's just it's a dumb idea. So Bat Family, Spider Family, you can get rid of them all because I'm not interested. So I I agree. The superhero not not that the superhero families are too big, they're dumb. Number four, there's no good reason any comic should have dozens of variant covers. Oh, a, oh God, you tell me about it. Um, I'm good friends with my local comic shop owner, and uh, you know some of these variant covers he's got to buy. Like he's got to put up money for about a hundred copies of, say, covers A and B before he can have the retailer only sketch variant that's worth you know a hundred but there's only a hundred of them made or whatever it is it's just insane this is kind of what contributed to the downfall of the industry in the early 90s when you had all those laminate covers and foil covers and variant covers and the what do they call that the uh not the hologram ones but you know what i'm the lenticular covers it was just it's insane and somehow some geniuses here at the big two think that because sales are dwindling, maybe if we offered all these variant covers from top flight artists, it'll get, it'll stimulate sales. Uh, no. And I, I played the variant game for a while, a couple of years ago, and then I just gave up and I don't care. Whatever's on the shelf is what I'm grabbing because I am not going to play this game. Uh, the other thing they do with the variant covers too, is they'll mark them up an extra buck or two sometimes. So, you know, the, the cover A, which is your standard cover, would be four ninety nine, and then variants B and C are five ninety nine. dollars uh, And then as you go in higher, because they make they print less of them, it, it goes up from there, $25, $50, $100. It's insane. Number three, fans miss a world that wasn't quite so bat-centric. I don't know about that. I mean, she could be right. She could be right here. However... If you look at the sales numbers at DC Comics, the only books that sell right now are Batman books. And they're so popular, they're putting backup stories in there to get other characters exposure um, because the Batman books are the only ones selling. These other characters couldn't survive in their own books at this point um, because DC has pretty much burned their house to the ground. Um, so... Well, it might be a bat oversaturation. If you go look at DC's roster of comics, it's very bat family heavy. But at the same time, um, that's the only way they've been able to stay afloat. Um, you know, there's been theorized over the last couple of years that DC is probably going to start licensing these characters out because they might not be a publisher much longer that they've taken on so much water financially. So, yeah, while they are very bat centric, they're also doing whatever they need to do. To survive. Number two, deconstruction stories have long outstayed their welcome. Amen to this. Uh, you can thank Alan Moore back in the day with The Watchmen, and you can say Neil Gaiman's Sandman and uh, Batman's Killing Joke, and a lot of these dystopian level comics. Uh, Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns. Um, they started this trend of amplifying flaws in the characters and flaws in their surroundings flaws in the supporting characters and it just became the, that darker edgier world now i'm not saying it's a bad thing uh but what happened is those because those were so different in the 80s i mean they just came out of nowhere and you had these uh colorful happy punch em up superhero comics and along comes the Dark Knight Returns and The Watchmen, and suddenly everybody, and they sold like gangbusters, so everybody wanted to go in that direction and start taking uh, these darker angles on things and, and have these brooding heroes. And it's gotten to the point, getting back to her original point about trans, you know, writing these things for movies and television, that uh, Superman himself in, in Zack Snyder's Man of Steel is a brooding, flawed character. 
Superman was always a beacon of hope and optimism and, and, and not a brooding, uh, you know, self, uh, n- lack of self-confidence and, and not sure of his place in the world. That's not what Superman's supposed to be. So, um, yeah, I think it's time to kind of right the ship. Let's get back to, he's back there somewhere, my Christopher Reeve. Uh, let's get back to that Superman, can we? And lastly, too many comic events will turn away many readers. Amen. I've had it with the events. I've, I would buy into them up until, I'd say, 10 years ago or so, and then I said enough. Because first of all, these event books usually suck. They're not written well. Uh, they're an excuse to cram every single character into their, in their universe into it. Um, it's, it, the uh, pacing's bad, the storytelling is even worse, uh, you know, you're just trying to get, spotlight way too many characters and give them all their moment, and then worse, I think what they've done in recent years is you have to buy issues of other titles to follow along with the event storyline, so for instance, say they have a uh, Spider-Verse 1 through 12, in between each one of the Spider-Verse main issues, you'll have to go buy Amazing Spider-Man and Miles Morales and Spider-Gwen and uh, whatever else, spider stupid shit they have out there, Venom, whatever, just for a couple of panels that actually tie into that main event arc. And a lot of that's done because they want to stimulate sales of books that are struggling. So, um, yeah, enough with the events. And it, it just, you know, it used to be a once a year thing, and now it's almost, it's the soon as one ends, they're right into the next one. Um, and I think a lot of people have tuned out. They're not buying into it anymore. It's clearly a giant cash grab. So, um, yeah, surprising that this came from CBR, gang, because uh, these kind of sites just drive me insane because all they usually do is seal clap for the for the big two and for the, you know, established narratives out there. Um, But the one that she didn't hit on is the last one that I'll add to this little list, and that is um, the talent producing these books these days. A lot of it's cheap talent because we know that the big two don't pay um, anywhere near what they should or used to. You have that problem, so you have a lot of inexperienced writers and artists. You also have a lot of activists posing as writers, and that's a huge problem. Because they've infiltrated the Western comic book industry and they've turned their books into their personal political platform. And that, to me, uh, would would rank as as number one. Uh, This has happened in the last five or six years. It's gotten intolerable. Um, It even finds its way into the bigger titles sometimes. There's a panel or two where you just cringe um, I just got done reading one of uh, Batman, uh, One Bad Day, I think it's called, One Bad Day. It's the Penguin issue, and right in the middle of it is you marginalized me with your microaggressions, and like, n- really? <laughs> really? This is what I got to read in my Batman comic book? So, uh, so that's, to me, the biggest culprit. So if we can just get the politics out of the comic books, if we can make them fun again, if we can get back to some more one-off stories, if we can kill these giant events uh, and stop writing books aimed at movies with dystopian overtones, I think we can actually save the comic book industry and return it to what it once was, which was a fantastic medium to let your imagination soar. You know, a four-color world with unlimited potential. Let's see that again. So that's it for me. Uh, Leave a comment below. Please like, share out the video. And again, please subscribe to the channel if you have not. Uh, I will uh, talk to you soon. And again, Happy New Year to you all. If you enjoyed this video, please give us a thumbs up below. Also, please subscribe to Geek Time TV. It really helps us grow the channel. And make sure you hit that bell icon in order to receive notifications every time we drop new content here. You can also check us out on social media on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at GeekTimeNet. Thanks again for watching. We will see you soon. Hey kids, what time is it?